Let There Be Carnage is the sequel to the 2018 Venom movie that was supposed to come out last year, got pushed back to this year, where there was a threat that it was going to be pushed back even further to 2022, but then Shang-Chi came out, saved the day, now it's out a little, a couple weeks earlier than it was supposed to, so that's cool and all? Let's talk about Venom 2, Carnage Boogaloo. This movie picks up a year after the events of the first Venom. Uh, Eddie Brock and Venom are still kind of getting used to living with each other. It's very hard, believe it or not. Uh, he's interviewing Cletus Cassidy from prison, played by Woody Harrelson, trying to find bodies of the people that he's murdered. He's a serial killer. And one time when they're having a altercation in the prison, Woody Harrelson bites into Eddie Brock's hand, gets a little bit of that symbiote into his bloodstream, and becomes Carnage. And now there's a fight between Venom and Carnage. We can't let Carnage leave and escape because he's gonna kill more people, we gotta learn how to work together. That's what the whole movie's about, baby. <laughs> this this relationship, this romantic relationship between Eddie Brock and Venom, not even kidding. If you're watching my channel in 2018, you know that I was not a big fan of that first Venom movie at all. In fact, I hated it. Um, I rewatched it a couple months ago when the first trailer for this movie dropped and yeah, I, uh, the, the, the feeling was the same. In fact, it was a little lowered my grade, like, to, like, a solid little D. Um, I, I really did not like that first Venom movie. I thought they really squandered their potential of what they could do with the character of Venom. The fact that Spider-Man isn't involved kind of seems to defeat the purpose of, like, what the Eddie Brock character kind of is, but they're doing their own interpretation, which is usually fine, but their interpretation was Garbo. I think my biggest issue with that first Venom movie is that it felt like a by-committee Sony movie, where it didn't feel like there was a true visionary at the helm. Ruben Fleischer might as well have been like some other guy, you know, because they're just, there's just nothing of an artistic view on this character, on this story. It just felt like, well, we want to do this. We also want to do this. We want to have this and this and this, so let's just cram it into a movie. Ultimately, its purpose was just to basically sell the next movie, you, you know, the, the entire movie. It feels like they're rushing through the origin story, sloppily telling it, and then you get a post credit scene where it's like, hey, this will be the next movie, so you're glad you bought that ticket, right? So going into this movie, I wasn't really excited for it. When they announced that Andy Serkis was doing it, I was like, okay, that could be interesting. You know, he's a director. I can't say I liked his Jungle Book movie, Mowgli, Legend of the Jungle, um, but, you know, maybe given the right script, the right kind of material, he can make something really good. He's not a completely incompetent director. Uh, the fact that Tom Hardy was getting a story by credit, I was like, okay, maybe Tom Hardy is trying to, like, you know, save this franchise. He understands what this needs to be, so he's gonna, you know, try to will his way into how the story is told, which, hey, somebody needs to be at the creative helm of this, you know? We, we can't just have it all be run by Sony execs. So there was a part of me that was like, maybe. And also the subtitle, I really loved, like, Let There Be Carnage sounded excellent to me. I was like, that's just such a goofy subtitle. I love it so much. So there was a bit of time where I was like, maybe, just maybe, there's hope for this Venom 2 movie. And then, you know, marketing kicked off and I was like, well, that was a, you know, I don't, I don't think, I don't think this is going to be good like I thought it was going to be. I'm not sure, but I am always giving it a chance. You know, there was some really bright buzz coming out of it saying it embraced, you know, a, a consistent tone this time around. And it was actually fun and Tom Hardy's great. So I was like, okay, I want to like this movie. Let's see if I do. A lot of people are, so that'd be great if I was one of them. And look, it's better than the first movie. I can definitely say that. It's better than the first Venom. Um, and I'll tell you why that is. I'll give out the reasons in a second. But as far as, like, an actual good movie, I can't really say. You know, what, people make comparisons to the first Venom. Like, it feels like an origin story character for, like, the 2000s, the early 2000s when people didn't really know what to do with these properties yet and were just kind of like, well, let's just do whatever. This movie kind of feels like a sequel made in the 90s quickly made in the 90s, you know, because there's a general rushed nature to everything in this movie. It's one of my biggest issues with it. When they announced the runtime was like an hour and a half, I didn't really think much of it because I was like, okay, well, if it's that runtime, then hopefully there's a reason for it. You know, everything is pretty tight and we, we don't really need extra stuff. You're going to feel fulfilled once the movie is over. Andy Serkis said that this was intentional uh, to make it feel more like a thrill ride. So if you're intentionally going to make this an hour and a half, you have a story that's tight for it. And it's not, 
you know, there's just so many story ideas that can work if you develop them more that just feel completely kind of glossed over or forgotten. There's one point where Cletus Cassidy just throws out, hey, Eddie Brock, here's a, a line about how you had a traumatic backstory or something. And I was like, how did he figure out this information? Is that going to play a part in this too? Oh my gosh. And then it doesn't. It's just kind of quickly dropped. Even Cletus Cassidy, I can say one of the things that I really liked about this movie was Woody Harrelson's performance. He was at least consistently great. He's a really fun actor and he really embraced the ch uh, scene chewing nature of this kind of performance. You know, he was fun. But his character ultimately kind of boils down to, all right, well, here's the basic beats of his stuff and we're not going to really delve more into the dark kind of psyche of him, even as the film kind of gets into the third act and he says a couple additional information, like stuff that he wanted essentially, that's all I'll say, that kind of makes you think, man, that would have been really interesting if you actually did play this more dark, but instead you had this really really goofy kind of tone. I can say Woody Harrelson is fun as this character, but I can't say he you know, makes the character better by giving it something that wasn't there before. He's just doing what's on the page. He's just, he, he's doing what's on the page well, but he's not pushing it further. And as far as the goofy nature of this, I am totally fine if, if they are making a comedy, right? Uh, I, I always thought, like, the nature of the Venom character, it sounds very dark, you know, so I'm surprised that that's not the angle they're taking with this, especially now that we have a serial killer villain. The subtitle is Let There Be Carnage. This guy wants to carnage. He wants to murder everybody. The fact that it's PG-13 is like, okay, well, you're not going to see carnage in the sense of like, you know, you know, you're going to see carnage, but not carnage is basically what I'm getting at. Um, but also you have this goofy, jokey vibe going on throughout the entire movie. So it's like you have these really amazing opportunities to go dark and tell a story that's like really interesting and investing and you don't because you want to do comedy which is fine if the comedy is good and I can't say I really like the comedy in any of these films it's just I think it's mostly like for me as far as like the, the comedy that I like I like comedy that's clever cl comedy that's thought out and if you're gonna do like stupid comedy you need performers that can like really sell it you know C performers that like when they say stupid shit it's like that's the funniest thing I think I've ever heard. And when it comes to Tom Hardy, I like him as an actor. He's been in a lot of great stuff, a lot of great roles, but I don't think he nails it like everybody else claims he does. It's awfully distracting because, you know, he's British and he, he has to, you know, do an American accent, but he's a kind of particular kind of British where whenever he tries to do an American accent, it sounds weird. And it sounds like he could be slipping into another accent at any moment, and that especially carries over into this Venom sequel. And I don't think he sold any of the jokes that he was even telling. So when it came to Venom and Eddie bickering and, and having like that odd couple kind of relationship, fighting each other, um, a lot of people are saying like, this is really entertaining, this is so much fun, and I was just sitting there like, I can't vibe with this, you know? I, I, can't, I don't find this really particularly all that funny. It's not that clever, and I don't really buy Tom Hardy as this performer. As, as far as, like, the voice of Venom, I know it's mostly, like, the post-production team that makes that voice work, so hats off to them, and also the guys who did Woody Harrelson's voice for Carnage. Really good stuff, guys. But uh, their line, it's the lines of dialogue for him. It's, it's like they write him just as, all right, whatever's playing out in the scene, Venom's gonna give, like, audio commentary, just being like, what a pussy, you know, and shit like that, and it's like, okay, I, I, it's, it's one thing after the other as far as now he's going to say this, now he's going to say this, mostly either saying an insult to somebody when they can't hear and Eddie's getting distracted by it, or he's saying, I want to eat everybody. They actually have like a couple different scenes of like Eddie, like talking to himself because, you know, Venom's talking to him in his head, but there are people around him that make the, make the effort to kind of turn and be like, are you all right? And he's like, oh no, no, yeah, I'm fine. I'm just, you know, I'm, uh, I'm prepping and then continues to have like a weirdly specific specific kind of conversation to himself. You know, it, it's that kind of thing. It even, it even goes at one point like, shut up! And someone's like, excuse me? That whole sh comedy bit that's amazing. You know, it's so amazing. It's been done to death so many times. When it happened here, I groaned. There's only one scene in this movie where I thought Tom Hardy's performance, the, the staging as far as like them fighting and bickering, actually worked and kind of made me chuckle at parts. It's the scene, it's kind of like the big argument scene between the two characters. I was like, you know what, this is actually working for me. Like Tom Hardy is like acting off of himself in a way that is actually impressing me. Like this is kind of what I want to see more of from him. 
uh, in this movie. And, you know, the fight itself is actually entertaining and there's some funny bits in there, you know. And then the scene is over and then the movie carries on as they hopscotch through the rest of the, the rushed plot. And I was like, fuck, I wish that they had maintained that. There's plenty of moments also where people just don't notice certain things. You know, like uh, Venom is driving away on a motorcycle at one point and just like flips somebody off as they drive off. And it's like, are you not concerned? Like, I feel like the whole point is hiding, you know, keep hidden, don't be in sight. And here he is like just extending a body part at one point. Cletus Cassidy breaking out of prison is just like wandering around in the open with his face on the news and isn't concerned in the slightest over it. You know, at one point Venom goes to a nightclub and does the whole like, man, that's the most amazing costume I've ever seen. Thank you. That's, that's, uh, that's exactly right. Like that whole, that whole tired bit, you know, when someone who's like a creature goes into a, a party or club and everyone's like, yo, I don't believe that this is a real thing right now because we're at a costume party and that's the best costume I've ever seen. <sighs> it feels like they're intentionally doing dumb things at some points just for the sake of doing them. Like, um, uh, there's a flashback in the beginning of the movie with the character Shriek, who, by the way, um, Naomi Harris did not... They, they didn't do her justice in this at all. She barely has anything to do. They try to insert some um, um, Cletus Cassidy relationship stuff near the end, but it's like, to what avail? N nothing, you know? Like, if you see the movie, you know that, you know, they completely wasted any opportunity uh, they could have had with this character. But there's a flashback to, like, her origin, like, when she's a little girl. Uh, it's not really her origin, but it's like, what? how did she end up in this, like, little glass cell where no sound can get out? Well, she was being transported one day, and uh, there, there was a guard just sitting there across from her in the back of the car. And even though they are well aware that her ability is to shriek, like, hey, I can yell real loud and cause some damage, she's just sitting there in the back of this truck being transported with no, like, no gag, no, like, duct tape at least. Like, there's literally nothing to prevent her from doing the thing that she's like being transported to a different cell for doing. And it's like, are, are you actually like not thinking about this when you write the script? I don't know what's going on here. Or like even though Eddie Brock was kind of at the center of the destruction at his apartment building the year prior, he still lives there. He lives in the exact same place and it's even more of a mess than usual. It would be, it would actually be funny if there was like some understanding between like the building owner and him. Like, hey, I'm, I won't fuck with you. I kind of get that there's some stuff going on. Just, you know, if, you know, if you could do something with that. Um, but you know, we got to keep it rolling. So there's a part of you that's like, wow, this is literally just the exact same place, except it's more of a dump uh, than last time. Actually, I forgot to mention something. In that flashback with Shriek, when she's a younger girl being transported, they show Cletus Cassidy, who is a younger guy, like about a teenager. And um, it takes place in 1996, if I remember correctly. And I'm not trying to say that 1996 was, like, very recent, you know, because it is 2021. That is literally 25 years. Uh, and Woody Harrelson has definitely aged since 1996. But he still looks like Woody Harrelson in 1996. You know, he's still in that age area where you're like, yep, that's just a younger Woody Harrelson. I don't know why they cast a teenager for this, for this character, and obviously it's because, you know, for the movie, the character is supposed to be this age, but instead we have Woody Harrelson, you know? It's like, okay, I, I, I see what's going on here. But like I said, at least Woody Harrelson is putting something into this role that is entertaining, whereas everybody else I like, could not get behind. I feel really bad for Michelle Williams, you know? I think she's a terrific actress, she could play some really fantastic roles, but instead she's in Venom. In the last movie, it felt like, yeah, she's just the love interest, and there's not really much going on with her. In fact, it feels like she's kind of sleepwalking through a lot of this. And it's kind of the same with this one. The performance didn't really get to a point where I was like, man, she's really making this role her own and putting something into this. It was kind of like, well, nope, she's here for a paycheck. It's part of the contract, probably. So this is the role, you know? And it's kind of a thankless one. And you can't really blame her for not really caring to be here. Like, she becomes like a damsel in distress, pretty much. It, like, she, she literally spends like the majority of the third act tied up. It's like, wow, we're, we're going back to that. It's been a while, I think, since we've seen, like, legitimate damsel stuff in, like, these superhero movies. But at least, like, in the good ones, like Spider-Man 1 and 2, when Mary Jane is captured, you feel something, you care a little bit, you're like, okay, I, I like this character, I understand the dramatic emotional stakes going on here, I understand why it's important to the plot, so I'm into it. 
Um, and this is just like, well, we need it to happen. <laughs> you know, you don't care at all. She, her initial scene in the movie is telling Eddie Brock, hey, I'm getting married to that other guy from the last movie. Not that that really plays a part into the Eddie Brock character arc or anything. It's just kind of like, well, I feel bad because I still love you, Anne. And, uh, yeah. That's it. That's the end of that. Well, except for, like, Eddie Eddie is trying to move on and Venom's like, No! We, we should hate the new guy! Come on, Eddie! And that's, you they have some comedic back and forth with that for a bit, which was classic. Speaking of the new boyfriend, I, I, I thought he was, like, fine in the last movie. Like, watching him in that, I was like, hey, he seems like a nice, good guy. You know, he's not, like, a secretly evil guy who Eddie Brock's gotta beat up so he can get back with Anne or anything. Um, but in this one, not that he's bad, he's just unfunny. They don't give him the best of lines, and it's like, man, it would have been better if you just weren't here. You know, if it was just Michelle Williams. But, you know, you gotta be here because you're in the last movie. We need as many of the old people as possible. That's why Mrs. Chen comes back. Who's admit she's admittedly fine. She's she's totally fine in the role. But like one of the worst offenders as far as like the performance wasn't working, the character was just really off as like this cop played by Stephen Graham, who I thought was Donnie Wahlberg for the longest time, just because Donnie Wahlberg looks similar and he played cops in the Saw movie. He played a cop character in the Saw movie, and he's probably played other cop characters before. But his character, they try to give him some kind of like backstory of like, oh yeah, well in the past I did this, and it's like, all right, well, <laughs> okay, you know, like I, I guess that's relevant to the character. Kind of, it's just kind of relevant just so he can be in the third act because there's no other reason for him to be otherwise. But it's, it's not like it adds anything to his character. His character is mostly just, I'm angry and I'm yelling at you, Eddie Brock. You gotta, you gotta interview Cassidy and give me everything you got, you know? And it's like, man, you're overcooking it to a point that's absurd, you know? Like, it, it even gets to a point where he makes a decision to, like, do something that ultimately propels the rest of the movie to happen. And I was like... Why? You know, like, I, I don't understand any of your decision making. You know, I, I just, I don't get, I don't understand what's going on with this character. I don't know why it was written the way it was. It was very embarrassing, if I'm being honest. Um, it literally, like, when I say, like, it feels like a sequel from the 90s, this is one of those elements that feels like it because it's just a stereotype of a, of a angry a chief, you know? And it seems like at the end of the movie, they, they're leaving the character in a way that's like, hey, we just set up the actual origin for who this character is supposed to be. I don't know if that's... I don't know if this is a character from the comics who becomes, like, a supervillain or, or something like that. I don't know. But it feels like it, the way they kind of end on it. But it doesn't feel like it was properly earned. And once you get to that last shot of that character, the movie, you know, never cuts back to him for an actual resolution. The movie, as I said, due to the general rush nature of everything, just kind of hopscotches to a finish. Just so they can get to, like, that hour and a half runtime and just end it. You know, it's it's a really bad movie, and then there's a post credit scene, and then I realized, holy shit, they did it again. They made another movie, very quickly, very sloppily, just so they could get to a post credit scene to sell the next movie. I'm not going to spoil what it is, because it's, it's probably already out there on the internet, but my god, it's just such a... You know, look, it's it's probably not that bad, but there's like a dude bro behind me. You know, there's a row of dude bros who before the movie started were really obnoxious. Then the movie started, they quieted down, which was good, but then this post credit scene happened, and one of them was like, HOLY FUCK! WHOA! OH MY GOD, I'M BLOWN AWAY! And it's like, what the fuck are you doing? Shut the fuck up! There's families here, stop saying the F word, you motherfucker! People want to watch the movie and experience this post credit scene without you just fucking interrupting! Life is not your reaction video, pal! So that was annoying. Um, but also thinking about it, there's just this like, hey, we just kind of did it kind of nature to it of like, this feels like something that you should probably save for the movie this is actually going to be in, but instead you're putting it here and it does not gel with everything else that just happened, so it stands out. As much as I love the post credit scene in Far From Home, don't get me wrong, but that is like, why are you putting that in the post credit scene when it feels like it's big enough to be at the end of this movie? You know, like, because at that point, there are still people that leave. You know, it's it's odd to see, but it's there's still people that leave when the credits immediately start playing and don't stay. So why would you put something this big that's not really a tease for the next one. It's literally just the entire setup. 
why would you not put it at the end of the movie and put it in one of the post credit scenes? It's kind of the same thing with this one that they do here, where it's like, this is big enough to just be put at the end of this movie. Not that it really is about this, though. It wouldn't gel with anything else going on. But, like, still, it doesn't matter, though. These are all product movies. These Venom movies just exist to sell the next movie. Even that first Venom movie, when they were, after they were done promoting Venom 2, Let There Be Carnage, they were like, well, let us promote Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse, which comes out a couple months after this, you know? And it's embarrassing. These movies, like, I know people have, you know, the, their enjoyment with them, they have a fondness for them, and that's totally fine if you have fun with it. I can honestly kind of see it, because they're so ridiculous that it's hard to believe that there are movies still made like this. Big budget ones, especially. So if you enjoy these movies, that's totally fine. But for me, I kind of, this just isn't my view of, of Venom and what they are giving me just does not work either. You know, I'm totally fine with my expectations being subverted, being open to a new interpretation of something, but I just don't, I, I can't really gel with these movies because they're just, I, I find them clumsily made, sloppily written. Honestly, Andy Serkis directing this didn't really do anything because the uh, one thing I can say positively is that the action is a little clearer in the last movie. I thought the action was really lame. You know, uh, the, like at one point there's just like a motorcycle car chase going straight the entire time. One turn, but then continuing to go straight, you can feel the beats of, well, now Venom's got to take out this. And he did, you know, showing, you can feel the beats of the showing off my powers scene, essentially, and the, and the final one with Riot and him was like a joke. <laughs> um, but in this one, you know, it's a little more clear. I was worried about that because Carnage looks so similar, but that distinct red actually does help in the different powers that it has. So I can at least say the action is easier to get into this time around. I can't say that they necessarily improved the visual effects. Like, it doesn't look awful or anything, but just so many times I'm watching it and I'm like, it just doesn't look like it's blending in well with anything, you know? It just very much so looks like what it is, which is a digital effect. Which is weird because this is Andy Serkis, and I thought if you're gonna get him, he's probably going to really work with the special effects, but it just, it feels like Ruben Fleischer again. It might as well have just been him again because there's no different artistic take with the storytelling or with the direction itself. It just feels like the same guy who made the last movie made this one, and there's some things that were better, but not everything, you know? So it's like, I don't... Ugh. So yeah, I, I don't know why Sony has decided to approach these movies the way they have, you know? Uh, especially since the MCU is handling all the Spider-Man movies, you would think, like, maybe we should save Venom for, like, why, why don't we let them do it, you know? I, like, especially since one of the main critiques was that you guys just have no idea how to actually properly build up a franchise, build up a cinematic universe. That's why the Amazing Spider-Man movies failed. But I guess uh, Disney is handling the Spider-Man movies so we can do our little, uh, our Venom side projects and Morbius and, and the uh, Silver Sable, is that still happening? Black Cat? Uh, all right. If, if this is what we're getting, all right. Sony made cinematic universe where Disney is taking care of the main guy but these other characters that probably could also be cool with the MCU, they're off to the side. All right, whatever. I'm gonna give Venom Let There Be Carnage a D plus. There are things to like about this. As I've said, some of the technical aspects do work better. Um, I do like the initial setup for the uh, plot of this movie. There's that one scene I mentioned that works. Uh, Woody Harrelson is fun to watch. Some of the action is cool, um, but there's just so much overcrowding that as far as like, bad stuff from the last movie that is carried over and embraced, and some new bad stuff, just given how much they're trying to gram into this movie. I can't vibe with it. it whenever Venom 3 comes out, if they change directors to someone more exciting than Andy Serkis, I'm probably not going to buy it, because, you know, what happened here was that they changed Ruben Fleischer out with a director more exciting, and then it turned out to be exactly the same, stylistically. Um, so I, I don't care. <laughs> but if you've seen Venom, let there be carnage. Leave in the comments below what you thought of it. And as always, thank you guys for watching. Make sure to subscribe. I'm Jackson Fulcher. See you guys next time.